Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand together. If you're still in the courtyard, start making your way in. Glad we get to sing together this morning, to sing the gospel together. This is, uh, this is my favorite psalm, Psalm 130. Here's what God's word says. I will wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen for the morning, more than the watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So today as we sing, let's remember that. Let's remember that our God is a good God and he loves his children. So we can sing to him, we can come with confidence to him because of what Jesus has done. Come on, let's clap and sing today. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence strong near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice! Sing the mercies of your King and with trembling rejoice. Children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial blood. Bring reconciliation to the world that longs to know the affections of a father. Come on, let's sing it today. King and with trembling we all our sickness, all our sorrow. Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us, He is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle. So take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him. He hears your voice. That's true. That He will wipe away your tears. Rejoice and in the midst of suffering. Give our God praise. When we get together to sing, we love to sing the scriptures together. And so this is from Romans. It's really simple if you've never heard this song before. We're just going to repeat the same thing over and over again. This is from Romans 5. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. We rejoice in the glory of God. Well, let's sing it. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the glory of God. We have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. It's only by His grace we stand Once bound by sin and shame Now slaves to righteousness Our faith perfected by His love Praise the Savior, He has won Our sins defeated through His blood It's good news Now exalted, Jesus reigns Hail the King, praise His name. While we were weak, He died, making us reconciled to God for all eternal days. Come on, let's put our hands together. And even in our fading flesh, our only hope and rest is found in faith that Jesus saves. Praise the Savior. He has won as our sins defeated through His blood. Now exalted, Jesus reigns. Hail the King, praise His name. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the glory of God. Our hope of glory is found in the one who gives great joy to sing about. It's the love that he poured out. Forever lifted high our Savior Jesus Christ. The gift to God given in love. Praise the Savior, He has won Our sins defeated through His blood And now exalted, Jesus reigns Hail the King, we praise His name We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God We rejoice in the hope the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Come on, let's sing it together. We rejoice in the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Rejoice in the glory of God. Well, let's sing the scripture together. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the glory of God.
So at this time, our youth are going to be dismissed. If you're new with us uh, or if you want to get connected and serve in some way, we ask you to find our connect, uh, connect with us cards. They're out there. We also have sermon notes out there for anyone who can't um, or, or doesn't have a phone with them. Um, or some sermon notes are online, but they're also back there printed if you want to pick up a copy of those. And um, yeah, we have the next seven minutes to get coffee and to enjoy one another's company and we'll be back in here in seven minutes. See you then. So turning to Genesis chapter 40 verses 1 through 23. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hands as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the fall season and the opportunity we have to come together as worshipers of you, Lord, in a public setting, in a public place, with your word readily available. A luxury that many people in the course of time, and even in the current experience of the world today, don't have available to them. So we thank you for this chance to come worship corporately together in freedom and just pray, Lord, on Pastor Randall that you would just use him to illuminate the text to help us understand what it meant to the audiences of the day as well as to how it still applies to us today. 
Let us not be like the cupbearer, Lord, that, that in our moment of joy, in our moment of good bearings and, and good position, we forget the people that got us there, Lord, and especially we don't forget you in that, that the gifts we have been given are given to us from you and for the edification and, and betterment of your, your church on this earth, Lord. We thank you. We pray these things and say these things in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kelsey. Good morning, everyone. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Randall, and I'm the lead pastor of Grace City. And really, it's been a joy to be able to be a part of this strategic alliance. Um, you know, one of the cool things, even Kelsey, who just read scripture, um, found out that he has been friends with my brother-in-law since high school. Um, so just seeing those types of connections have really been amazing. I, I talked with a friend this week, uh, goes to Grace City, said he found out this week that his neighbor down the street goes to First Baptist, and so they connected, and they were living right on the same street, didn't even know now that they're a part of the same church. So I thought that was really cool. And that's what we're talking about when we're saying, okay, we want to be better together. We want to be together for our city for the glory of God. We want to see God write a story that's a lot bigger than what we could have done ourselves. Um, and so today, you know, we're going to continue in the book of Genesis. Um, we've been in this series last week. Pastor Scott preached uh, from Genesis 39. Today, I'm going to be talking from Genesis 40. Um, and we've been looking at the life of Joseph. Um, and Joseph's life is very uncertain in many ways because he's thrown into slavery um, by his own family and then uh, now he's imprisoned wrongfully. And so you, you see all of these things happening in Joseph's life and you think to yourself, okay, God, where are you? What, what, what's happening here? All of these circumstances are playing out, but they're playing out exactly the way in which God intended them to. Um, and so today we're gonna be looking at this passage in Genesis 40. And the title of the message is this, Waiting on God's Timing. Waiting on God's Timing. And so over a span of six weeks, we're studying the life of Joseph. And what we'll see is that Joseph's life is filled with many examples of God's faithfulness um, throughout and despite his own sin, in the midst of heartache, challenges, moments of silence and even disappointments right Joseph isn't a perfect man the only perfect man in the Bible is Jesus Christ and so what we see is that Joseph is a man who struggles yet we see him overcome the challenges that he faces but the only way that he does that again throughout the scriptures we only have one hero and it's this it's God God is the hero throughout scripture and what we see is that God, again, meets Joseph in his time of need. So again, the first week we talked about this dream that Joseph had. God gives Joseph a dream. And what we talked about in our society is we, we, we want to follow our dreams. We want it to be about our dreams. But really, what is God's dream? And so part of what God had for him is that he was betrayed by his own brothers, and right, his brothers were frustrated with his dream that Joseph had. They even said in Genesis 37, two, uh, 20, 37, 20, they said, come now, let's kill him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Right, so if it were up to his brothers, it would have been the end of the story. But again, God is the hero. And so last week, we talked about how Joseph trusted God in the midst of temptation. He was betrayed by Potiphar's wife who continually tempted him. Yet he overcomes by God's strength, and through that he's wrongfully imprisoned. And so Joseph now is waiting on God's timing. We know this. Ti timing, perfect timing, is important. Uh, I was having a conversation with my daughters yesterday. One of the things that they are really uh, adamant about is that, Dad, it's time for a dog. We, we need a dog. Dad, we've already got some picked out. We've already named our dog. We, we, we know that it's time for a dog. And I say, I'm looking at you right now, and I, and I want to trust you, but I don't think it's time for a dog. <laughs> Why is it not time for a dog? Well, you know, there's some maturity that needs to happen if you're going to have a dog. And so what's happening here is in the midst of the waiting time, God is maturing Joseph to be a leader. Not a leader for himself, but the type of leader that God wanted for him to see what God's dream 
truly was and, and, and intended to be. You see, last week in, in, in ended with this wrongful imprisonment, but it, it reminds us in verses 20 and 21 this. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. See, what this does is this pulls back the curtain for us. Right, we're going through life. We, we don't see all the, the ways in which God is working, but this for us pulls back the curtain because do you remember Genesis 37? God wasn't mentioned at all. And that was on purpose because there will be times in your life where you're just walking and going through life and it feels like God's not there. But again, now we see in, in Genesis uh, 39 and, and 40 that God is pulling back the curtain saying, I am there commentator Gordon Wenham says this he says despite all appearances God was on Joseph's side in his deepest humiliations God was still for him even though he was being humiliated out in public God was there and when we get to chapter 40 in these verses sometime later we find that Joseph has been in prison for a long time a long time and it's going to continue. See, let's bring this to reality. What, what are some of the arguments that you have when you're waiting on God and you say, God, are you even there? What, what are some of the things that we say? God, I, I know you're there, but, but what's going on here? I'm wasting my potential. You don't understand what I've been through up to this point, God. I deserve better than this. See, aren't those all of the things that go in our heart and mind as we're going through struggles? But what do we see in Joseph's life? Right, I'm sure he's had, he had some of those thoughts that we don't see recorded in Scripture. He was human just like you and me. But what is God doing? Why, why is he allowing this? It's because God's dream for Joseph was much bigger than anyone at the time could see. God's dream was to save people and reconcile a family. Right, God's dream. But it had to be the right time. It's all about timing. God's timing. Elizabeth Elliot, who was a missionary at one point, she lost her husband, um, who was killed on the mission field. But here's what, here's what she says. This is very profound. She says, waiting on God requires the willingness to bear uncertainty to carry with oneself the unanswered question, lifting the heart to God about it whenever it intrudes upon one's thoughts. Right, you're gonna have moments and times where you're gonna wonder, okay, God, are you there? What do I do with this struggle right now? But where do you take it? Do we just wrestle with it in our own minds and hearts and say, well, I guess this is just the way it is and God's not there? Or do we bring it to him? God, help me in my when I don't understand. And so here's the thing. Let, let's listen. In the waiting, God is working. Just take that with you. Like, in the waiting, God is working. Right? There's, there's so much there that we need to understand. Second Peter 3, 9 says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach Repentance. Right, what is repentance? It's simply this. God, you're right and I'm wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. How many times have you looked back on your, your past and, and, and said, wow, I really was hoping that this one thing would go through, but it didn't. And I was really frustrated with God about it, but then I look back now and that was actually the best thing. Right, it was the best thing. I'm glad it didn't work out the way I thought it should. That's why God is God and we're not. But it says that in many ways, we try to apply our time frame to God and say, God, you're slow. Hurry up. Remember, God not only wanted to accomplish a dream through Joseph and his family, but he also wanted to do a work in Joseph and his family. Do a work in them, inside their heart. And one of the ways God shapes character is over time. As, much, as frustrating as that can be for many of us, it's through time. See, God is again showing Joseph that he's not God and that he must learn to trust in God's timing. 
2014, the New York Post put out an article entitled Society's Self-Destructive Addiction to Faster Living. It's a secular person, not non-Christian. She's an author, uh, Dr. Stephanie Brown. But here's what she writes. She says, society is now dominated by beliefs, attitudes, and ways of thinking that elevate the values of impulse, instant gratification, and loss of control to first-line actions and reactions. I want it now or do it now are valued mantras for today's with it person, young or old. Add to instant action the belief that there are no limits to human power, no limits to action, no limits to success. Fueled by the grandiosity and omnipotence of these beliefs, people get high on the emotions of endless possibility with no need to ever stop or slow down. Right, this is somebody coming from a non-Christian perspective who says our life and the way that we think, we're out of control. We need to stop. See, but how do we do that? How do we apply that same thing to God and say, God, this is, this is how it should be. Right? It's slowing down, trusting the Lord is a good thing. But in many ways, we are a generation, when it comes to our view of time, that's frenzied and out of control. So let me ask, what would it look like to trust in God's timing over your own? God's timing over your own. As we look at the theme of this passage, God is teaching Joseph something much bigger that will help him throughout life. So again, our, our passage is Genesis 40, 1 through 23. And, and, and what does God develop in Joseph through waiting? Well, he develops three things that we can see from the passage. And I'll give you all three up front. Here's what they are. Number one, a compassion for others. Number two, an assurance of God's presence. And number three, a trust in God over man. A compassion for others, an assurance of God's presence, a trust in God over man. So the first one, a compassion for others. Look at verses two through seven. It says, and Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody and one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, each, of his, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in, the, in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? So what's happening here? Well, first, two high-ranking officials under Pharaoh angered him to the point that he throws them into prison. The verse could be translated that they actually like, sinned against their master, sinned against Pharaoh. And so what we know is that they deserved to be in prison. We don't know exactly what they did, but whatever they did, they deserved to be there. But remember, Joseph. Joseph was wrongfully thrown in prison but in verse four, was assigned by the captain of the guard to now serve these men. And one commentator, Derek Kidner, makes an interesting point when he, he says this. He says, it's not surprising that Joseph gets this assignment because it's very likely Potiphar is the one that's in this position of placing Joseph as servants to these men. He says, Joseph, having gained higher ground, was at the bottom again a servant of prisoners. This, however, was to prove the way forward. Right, if this, if this were Joseph just thinking, okay, if this is my next step up in the world, it's not. He's actually being lowered again. See, what Potiphar may have intended was just another jab of revenge. But what we know is that God will even use that for good. Now, knowing all of this, let's look at verses 6 and 7. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled, so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? Why are your faces downcast today? First, let's remember what Joseph was like back in Genesis 37. 
See, in many ways, Genesis 37 depicted Joseph as an arrogant young man. Someone who, who didn't have a very high emotional intelligence or a relational IQ with other people. You remember as he started to tell his brothers that dream, what it, it said is that as he told them the dream, they hated him even more. Right, and so they hated him not just for the dream, but for the words that he used. Right, that's, that's Joseph back in Genesis 37, but, but now look at him. Through all of the challenges, through all the trials that he's been through, he's a, in many ways a different person. It says he saw they were troubled. He could actually see how they were doing and what was going on in their life. He wasn't just wrapped up in, oh, I got to do my job now, but he was wrapped up in, okay, well, they don't look like they're doing well. And so he asked the question, what are you struggling with? Now, now did he have to do that? Was that something that was a part of his job description? You know, to go up and to see that they were troubled and to ask them how they're doing today? No, not at all. But God was transforming this self-absorbed person who really, at the beginning, we see that he was fine with wearing a coat that made him stand out from everybody else. He was fine with that. Now start to care about those who are struggling. He becomes a person who cares about the needs of others. See, let me ask, what do you do when you're going through a tough time? What do you do when you don't get that promotion but it also it almost feels like a demotion. Do you still see others hurting around you and ask, how are you doing? See, for many of us, if we're honest, we turn inward instead of outward, don't we? We fall into the trap of what we could call self-pity or bitterness. We don't see those hurting around us because we're so wrapped up in our own problems. But after all that Joseph has been through, by the grace of God, he hasn't fallen into the trap of self-pity. He's living eyes wide open to the needs of others. Right, self-pity. Oswald Chambers said this about self-pity. He says, no sin is worse than self-pity because it removes God from the throne of our lives, replacing him with our own self-interest. It causes us to open our mouths only to complain and we simply become spiritual sponges, always absorbing, never giving, and never being satisfied. And there is nothing lovely or generous about our lives. You see, what is it that we start to see in Joseph's life is that he is a man that is being changed by God through the trials he's going through. And God is developing a character in him that cares for the hurting because he's actually experienced hurt himself. He's experienced wounds in the process. And so he starts to see those who are hurting around him. The second point is this, an assurance of God's presence. Look at verse eight. It says, they said to him, we have had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Now during this time in ancient Egypt, dream interpretation was big business. Dream interpretation uh, would have been something very familiar to the culture. And out of all the places that Joseph could have been, God placed him with these two men to help interpret a dream. A dream. See, dreams come back again into his life. And after all that he's been through again, do you see his response to them? Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? It's God. See, through the uncertainty, through the ups and downs, through the temptation, one thing has remained clear for Joseph, that God is still present in his life and that God is still God of the universe. See, remember what he said in the face of temptation last week in Genesis 39, 9? How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Sin against God. Joseph 
has a clear assurance of God's presence in his life, even in prison. And, and don't you see that this is the gospel, this is the good news? It's this, that my circumstances don't determine God's love for me. It doesn't determine whether God's there or he's not there. Right, we're all gonna have ups and downs in life. But the beautiful part is this, that God is constant when life's not. Hebrews 13, eight says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Isn't that good news today? That no matter what you're going through, the ups and downs of life, God is still the same. So Joseph listens to the dreams and interprets them. Again, not on his own wisdom, but on God's wisdom. And here's the outcome. For the cupbearer, it was good news. He'd be released and he'd be lifted up by Pharaoh, placed back into the position of power that he was in before. And so what we see is that the baker gets a little excited after he hears the news about the cupbearer. And so he tells Joseph, here's what my dream was about. And he found out that, that he'd be released, but then he'd be killed by Pharaoh. So it's not a great interpretation for him. But it, here's the thing. In the end, Joseph believed that everything came from God. It came from God. There was an assurance of God's presence even when it felt like God, are you still there? The last point is this, the trust in God over man. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says, only remember me when it is well with you. So he's talking to the cupbearer. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of his, this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they that they should put me into the pit. But then we get to verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Listen, listen to verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. And so what happens? Well, verses 14 and 15, Joseph simply asked the cupbearer to remember him and he starts to share his story with him. He says, here's what happened. I got stolen out of my homeland. This is what happened to me. This is the journey I've been on. C could you just remember me? And do you see the way he describes prison? He says he, ca he calls it the pit. The pit. See, this brings back memories for Joseph. It's as if he's perpetually been in a pit for most of his life. You ever felt like that? You just feel like you're in the pits, right? Like you just feel like everything is just down and it's not, nothing is, is good and it just keeps going, spiraling down further and further. And so the way he describes of where he's at and where he's been is it's, it's I'm in the pit, and so we have to ask ourselves, okay, what happens? Well, verses 20 through 23 tell us that the cupbearer and baker are released and everything happens as predicted, but the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. See, how many times do you think that um, you've been forgotten? Right, when you're, when you're putting out that resume or something's happening in your life, you're just like, okay, is something gonna happen here? And so we see that Joseph does everything he can to help get the word out about who he is and, and, and where he's at. He tells the cupboard, can you just do one simple thing? Like, this is gonna happen for you, but can you just do one simple thing? Can you just remember me and tell it to Pharaoh? That's the only thing I ask. And what we see is that it doesn't happen. He's forgotten. Right, again, one, one of the arguments that I have with my kids all the time is this. When are we gonna have dinner? When are we gonna eat? You know, when, when, are, when are you gonna take care of us, Dad? Like, we, you know, all these things. Like, like, guys, we eat dinner at the same time every day, you know, like it didn't, it didn't change. 
is coming. You just got to be patient. You got to wait, right? Like, same thing with breakfast. I'm going to get you breakfast, right? There, there's plenty of options here. We're going to help you out. Like, there, this is going to happen, right? And, and what it says in Scripture is that, you know, fathers, earthly fathers, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we, we're not perfect. But it says that your heavenly father is. He's always perfect. And he's always going to provide exactly at the right time when you need it. At the right time. Right, because there is a set time. Just like for us, we, we got a set dinner time. This one is going to be. It's going to come. But you got to trust it's going to come. See, God is a good God that doesn't forget about us even when people do forget about us. God is faithful to the end even when people let you down. Do you know what Joseph asked for here? Verse 14, he says, please do me the kindness. The kindness. You know the word he uses for kindness here? It's the word hesed. Hesed. And, and, and it's a particular word that means loving kindness and unfailing kindness. A love that, that lasts. That, that's what he's asking from the cupbearer. He's saying, could, could you just like love me enough to remember me in front of Pharaoh? But he doesn't. But do you remember in Genesis 39, 21, what it says about God? It said this, in Genesis 39, 21, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, same word, hesed. Hesed. An unfailing love and kindness, not from man, but from God. When Joseph was forgotten by man, he was not forgotten by God. God never forgets. And so just some takeaways. What can we learn from this? Well, the first one is this. Submitting to God's timing produces real hope, not hopelessness. Real hope, not hopelessness. Let me ask you this. How do you avoid the trap of self-pity and hopelessness? You ever felt that trap before? It's a dark place. It feels like a pit. It's by doing this, remembering that time is not wasted with God. Right? You might feel like other people are wasting your time, but God does not waste time. He created it. See, God has a much different perspective than we do. And so we need to ask, okay, why am I in this trap of self-pity? Why am I in this trap of hopelessness? Why do I feel like I'm in the pit right now? Am I trusting God and that he's able to get me out? That he's able to lift my head? Psalm 27, 14 says this, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Why does he talk about the heart? It's because the heart can be deceptive. Remember that? Jeremiah says that. Heart can be deceptive. So you need to speak back to your heart and say, take hope in the Lord. Like, take, take heart. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. And what, that, what happens is this, is that when you start to see the Lord, you start to see that there's hope. There's hope. Second, submitting to God's timing redeems our past hurts and pains. See, think about this for a minute. Dreams got Joseph into the pit. Remember that? Got him into the pit. But now God uses dreams to get him out of the pit. Because what we'll see next week is that Pharaoh has a dream. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to spark that cupbearer and say, I remember a guy. I remember a guy but it, it was at the right time when it came about but here's the thing Joseph didn't get to a place where he said 
man, I just hate dreams. I don't want to hear anything about dreams because God told me this dream in the past. It didn't happen, and so I'm done with dreams. He doesn't say that. Right, but he, he remembers that God is the one who gives dreams and interprets dreams and all of these things, and so he says, okay, I trust you, God, with this. Could have been a past hurt and pain, but God is going to use that in redeeming it. See, sometimes our greatest hurts and pains can be the areas of our lives that God uses for his greatest redemption. And he can use that to help others. In many ways, we want to hide from that and say, well, that's, yeah, that's my past. That's, but what would happen if God redeemed that in our hearts? He can do that. Lastly, submitting to God's timing grows our character. See, how, do, how does your character grow and, and my character grow? Have you ever had those moments where you look at people and, and how patient they are and loving they are and kind they are, and you say, man, how did you become that person? I want to be like you. I want to be that type of person someday. But in many ways, we don't know their story and what got them to that place, right? We, we don't know what kind of growth they had to go through to get there. We just want, again, we just want it that instantaneous, like I'm going to go through the drive through and get patience and kindness and be a person of character, right? Like that's not how it works. With God, it takes time. It takes submitting to, to him and saying, Lord, I, I need your help in every way. It says the Holy Spirit produces fruit in our lives, Galatians 5. Right? It's continually coming back to him saying, Lord, make me a person of character. I want to trust in you I want to become like you. C.S. Lewis said it well when he says, the Christian does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. You ever think about that? It's, it's, he didn't love me because I was a good person, because I had a, all the right things that made me the kind of person that, that I need to be, but it's by his grace that he meets me in my mess and pulls me up and loves me to becoming a person that I could have never been. See, it's his goodness that changes me. And so how do we see God's love displayed most clearly? Well, it's all about time. It's all about time. Because you know that what the scriptures tell us? It tells us this, that in Romans 5, 6, it says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Right, if you were to think through this, okay, Joseph, all he knows at that point is that he's in prison. He didn't know that he was going to be a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. We get to see that now. We get to see how God's story unfolds all the way to 2,000 years ago as Jesus walked this earth, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead. We get to see that. But Joseph is sitting there in prison just saying, God, I'm gonna trust you. And all of this unfolds to the right time when Jesus dies for the ungodly. See, how many ungodly things have we done <laughs> in time, right? Just looking up and saying, God, what, what's going on with my life? Christ died for all those things, and he'll meet you right here today, right now, in this place. And so will you open your hands to him and say, Lord, I trust you with my whole life because you died for every sin and so I receive you today. I'll receive you again. I'll trust you again. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that it's true that at the perfect time Christ died for us. It wasn't on our timing a lot of... Um, Jesus, your disciples thought it should have been a different way. 
thought it should have been a different time. They had a lot of thoughts. But the greatest thing happened on the cross when you died for us and for our sins. You paid for it all. And so help us to trust you in the big things and the little things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh God, you're near In the quiet Oh God, you're near In the shadow Oh God, you're near At my breaking God, you're near Oh God You never leave my side Your love Stand firm through all my life Search, oh God, you're near in my wandering, oh God, you're near and when I feel alone, oh God, you're near at my lowest, God, you're near. Oh God, you never leave my side. In your love, stand firm through all. nor death nor anything else could pull us apart we are joined as one by the blood hope will rise as we become more than conquerors through the one who loved the world hide nor death
to all my life. Amen. That's true today. I'm going to sing one last song this morning. And I want you to think and consider this morning that that it was us that deserved to be arrested. But Jesus was arrested on our behalf. And that it was us that deserved to die to pay the price for our sin, but Jesus died on our behalf. And it's through the victory that Jesus had over sin and death this morning that we are free free to worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's do that as we sing this final song. Remember what Christ has done for us. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested, my life began. The last was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, in my I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my death And he called me his friend Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But the Jesus
We thank you all for being here this morning. Um, you can leave your offering at the boxes by the doors um, with the ushers, and uh, we hope that you'll come back and join us again next week at 1030. We do have Kairos tonight for our young adult crowd at 610, and tonight we're going bowling for Kairos after dark, directly following our service. So if you'll join us at 610 for that tonight, we'll see you then. Bye.